we work with the criminal justice system. Um, we work with police officers, we work with law enforcement, we work with state's attorney's office, um, and we will continue to do that. But I think what one of the words that I think was key in your question, Rachel, was the word rely. <laughs> um, and, and I think that for an organization like ours, understanding the constrictions of, of the ways in which we are supported financially, for example, um, the realities of the systems that we work with, it's, it's more to me about the reliance. And what does that reliance look like? How does it get kind of, uh, how does that connect to the lived experience of the people who, um, who come to us to either volunteer at our organization or to um, receive services and participate in services? So, so I feel like what we've tried to do and what I've tried to do is to confront that reliance um, so that if we are interacting with those systems, that we are not in any way presenting those systems as the end all and be all, one size fits all, perfect and only option that's available to people. Um, and some of that has been about kind of engaging in conversations about restorative justice and how that intersects with violence against women. Um, some of that has been about relying, realizing that a lot of the work we do is um, we provide 24-hour crisis response to survivors in hospitals. And at this point, we work with 14 hospitals across the Chicago area. And if uh, someone who's been sexually assaulted goes into an emergency room, the hospital is actually required to call law enforcement. So that is why, I think, or one of the reasons why it is so crucial that there is an advocate present whose only agenda is the agenda of that victim. Um, and is able to help that person navigate what it is their agenda is. Now, I, I realize that we're talking, I'm talking about something that's on a very individualized basis rather than kind of talking about systemic, but this is how those systemic issues kind of get lived by people in that moment. And in that moment of crisis, to have an advocate there who really is guided by what the victim, what the survivor wants is, so important to interrupting that kind of pattern of reliance or the, the idea that there is only one path forward. Um, and it is that, it is that moment, I, I feel like, that really informs kind of my continued work um, and I think the work of RVA going forward. You know, that having been said, we have to have, we have to be honest, you know, and I think that it's, it's incumbent on me and I think a mandate, being a woman of color, being a queer woman of color in, you know, in a leadership position to, to allow for those questions to get asked, to have those conversations, to be honest in, in those answers, which say, yes, we do in ways collude with the prison industrial complex. We understand, however, that that cannot be where the story ends. And that cannot be like a statement but it has to be part of a dialogue. Um, and, and I think beyond that, like thinking about our work with, the, uh, with legal systems is also understanding that our prevention work, our education work, all of those pieces have to be informed by something beyond the question of, is this legal or illegal behavior, right? That's such a limiting construct in which to think of the type of harm that people are capable of, in, of inflicting on one another. So we have to be able to talk about in relational terms. We have to be able to talk about it in ethical terms. And that is not about the legal system. That's about us. That's about how we converse with one another. And that, that's also, I think, one of the guiding principles that, that RVA is imbued with and, and part of what allows me to continue to be, be there. Okay, I think that actually offers a good segue um, to shifting our focus a little bit. And um, I wanted to jump in here and ask Miriam a question. Um, I wanted to ask her, um, Miriam, you've done a lot of work um, within both the anti-violence and prison abolition movements. Um, I think that your experience actually offers a unique positioning of seeing how the issues are connected. Um, and I think that prison abolition and restorative justice work are often seen as male issues. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how prison abolition and restorative justice work are actually feminist issues for you. Sure. Um, so 
thanks again for having all of us. And I'm so really, I feel privileged to be on this panel with such amazing uh, women who've been doing so much work that I really uh, admire. So thank you for that. And for Beth for doing this book, which I think is critically important to helping us have these conversations, which are absolutely needed. Um, and I want to get into the conversation around restorative and, and uh, or transformative justice and prison abolition by speaking to actually an example in the book um, that Beth did not bring up in her examples of the stories that she told. And uh, that's the story of Tijuana Moore. Um, and I don't know how many of you know Tijuana's story. You may or may not know it. Um, but I was involved in that story, in, in helping... Uh, helping Tijuana, she was trying to figure out how to be and how to live in, in, in the situation that she was in. And also, um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that story in order to tell you about my work for a minute, about the intersections and the connections and why RJ and TJ could work. Um, so Tijuana Moore is a 19-year-old young woman. She, in 2010, calls the police to her house for a domestic dispute that she's having with her partner. Um, the police arrive, they separate them, as is what the police are now supposed to do, and they ask, take her to her bedroom and take the person who was her boyfriend downstairs, and two police officers are talking to them separately. Um, when she gets up to her bedroom, the police officer, um, at a certain point, makes some advances on her while he's in the room with her, while she's telling her story of having had this domestic violence situation occur, um, he gropes her, and then when he's leaving, he gives her his telephone number and tells her to call him. Okay, Mind you, she's just dealt with a domestic dispute. So she's, he's there supposedly as a person to intervene and support what this is going on, take information, and then see where it goes from there. She decides then that she's going to take this and make a complaint. She goes, she offers the complaint the first time, they don't take it. She goes back a second time to offer another complaint. She calls first, and this time they tell her, bring a witness with you. She shows up at the police station to make her complaint with a witness who happens to be her boyfriend. They tell the boyfriend that he shouldn't stay around, that he should go to McDonald's or something, get some coffee. And they take her into the room. These are two other internal affairs police officers to interview her about the story. She's in that room by herself, a young African-American, 19-year-old young woman, the cops begin to tell her that it would probably not be a good idea for her to file this complaint, that they would talk to the police officer, and more importantly, that he was a good guy. So obviously, they believed that something had happened to her, right? The cops did, and they're telling her, don't bother, don't worry about it, right? She asks to leave. They tell her, no, they locked the door. She's in there after a while. They say, we're going to leave you here for a few minutes. They go out. In that time, she decides she's got her Blackberry on her. It's got an audio recording. She's put, she turns it on. So when they come back, they continue to talk to her. And they're talking her down, telling her this is probably not a good idea for her to go forward. One of the cops notices that something's moving on her phone. They realize that she's taped them. They take the tape, and they refer the case to the state's attorney's office. The state's attorney's office prosecutes, takes the case on, and decides to prosecute, put her on trial for eavesdropping on law enforcement, okay? The potential sentence for this is 15 years in prison if you're convicted of this. Now, mind you that when she has this situation occur with the cop and she's trying to make the complaint, before this, she calls some rape crisis centers here locally. The rape crisis centers tell her they can't support her and help her. They don't offer her a referral to, a, to somebody who can help her, an advocate who might come with her to do her complaint. They don't bother to follow up on the actual trauma that she experienced of being groped in this way by the police in her room. Nothing. She doesn't get any help. She goes around and around and around. Somehow she falls upon a local lawyer who decides to take her case. There's an article in the, New York, in the paper in early 2011, and this is how I came into this case. We see this article about this young woman. It's part of a larger article that's really talking about eavesdropping in the police, not violence against women and girls. So the issue around the kind of erasure of the issue is really key here, right? But myself and a friend of mine, Melissa Spatz, who uh, is a good friend of mine, and we've worked together on many projects in the past. She no longer lives here in Chicago. 
we had started an organization called the Chicago Task Force on Violence Against Girls and Young Women as a way to try to talk about issues of violence in the lives of young girls and young women by focusing a little bit more on state-based violence and other forms of violence that weren't really being talked about. So I call Melissa up after I read this New York Times article. I send it to her. She says, what the hell, right? Let's figure out what's going on. So we call the lawyer. The lawyer says, oh, thank God, right? Because we've been trying to get people to get on this case around the violence against women and girls stuff, but nobody's fighting, nobody's helping. So we take on this situation, we try to push the state's attorney to drop the case, we get 5,000 petitions, we call people, our friends, and we tell them, hey people, this is what, and no one is interested, okay? This is 2011, this is not 1961, okay? And no one's interested for a number of reasons, I think, right? She's young, she's black, she quote unquote used to strip, there's all sorts of stuff involved here that I think people just don't want to get involved in. And the cops are involved, most importantly. And so is the state's attorney. Two places where you're colluding with those institutions. You've got money coming in because you're getting a grant from the attorney general, right? You're not trying to rock the boat. So what we, what we experienced through that process was two things. First of all, she goes after months and months and months of drawing out, they take her to trial. The, 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 you, I, mean, I don't know, I don't want to go into this trial, but it was a, a hot mess. Long story short is that she's acquitted on all charges. Now she's suing the city and the police, okay? So we're in this process where, does Tijuana Moore want to go to court against the police? Was that what she was asking for? No, she was not asking to go to court. She was asking to file a complaint to hold the police officer accountable because on the tape that, the, that her lawyer gets to show to the jury what's been going on, you, you, get, you, you hear the police officers trying to convince her not to go forward, okay, on the tape. And on the tape you hear Tijuana Moore say, I don't want this to happen to other young women. That's why I'm here. I just want him to be off the beat so that he doesn't do this to other people. Because if he's doing this to me, likely he's doing this to other people. The bravery that it takes for you to move ahead, even after having been rebuffed the first time, you go back the second time. What does the state's attorney in trial say while we're all sitting there with our slack jaws? The state's attorney says that this is proof that Tia Wanda Moore can't be messed with and that Tia Wanda Moore was editorializing and her job was basically to want to make a big case against the police. That was her purpose for going into that room to be able to deal with this situation, right? So now the victim of the violence, okay, is the one who caused the violence to herself and in fact gets dispossessed as being the perpetrator of the violence. And this happens to black women all the time, right? So in the scheme of this thing, we talk about transformative justice. So no, she doesn't want him to go to trial. She doesn't want to take him to prison. She ends up finding herself on the brink of going to prison for making a complaint right? But she's got no space. So imagine what would have happened if one of those centers had allowed for an opportunity to move because the criminal legal system basically puts a ceiling on our brain, as Alice Walker says about oppression, right? We cannot imagine how we can be helpful outside of the cops. We can't imagine how we can be helpful outside of the criminal legal system. What, what could somebody have done? They could have sent an advocate with her to file the complaint to the police, right? Is that, but that doesn't get seen as part of the mandate for the organization because violence is seen as too limiting, it's not broad enough. Secondly, they could have very easily organized some support circles for this young woman, peace circles, where she could have had a supportive group and community of people who would have helped her figure out what her next steps could be because she was so alone in this process. She had to move out of Chicago, she moved to Indiana because of all the stress, right? She could have gotten that support on the ground. That's an RJ intervention of a feminist perspective, right? That women of color, particularly black women, aren't victims of police brutality and violence. And I know Andrea will speak to this work, right? That's a big part of her work, is making women visible within that. So in abolition circles, your case and what happens to you isn't seen as as important, and it's not seen as as seminal as the things that happen to black men who are shot down by the police on a regular basis, right? But women are getting ass assaulted, shot down too, right? Uh, Rakia Boyd. I mean, there's any number of women that you can speak to, but they're erased within that prospect. So the work that we're doing on the ground is directly to try to make sure that state violence is seen in the same light as interpersonal violence that happens to you because your boyfriend knocked you upside the head or because some stranger raped you in the street, right? The cops harassing you and harming you and then the state taking you to court for it, that's a form of violence against women and girls.